everyone. Uh, my name is Sahar. Um, I am going to present you this web semi uh, webinar on MS International Management of MENA. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to this webinar and uh, I hope you enjoy the next uh, 20, 25 minutes of uh, the talk. Of course, you are more than welcome to post any questions that you have on the um, little chat box which should be appearing on your screens and then I can go through that and answer some of those questions at the end of the presentation. Um, so to begin with, what, um, let me tell you what we're going to do mostly today, what we'll talk about, essentially to provide you with an overall um, background to SOAS, uh, to the School of Finance and Management, which is essentially the department that you probably have an interest in, and also the department which hosts this MSC International Management of the Middle East and North Africa. Um, and then we'll move on to um, focus mainly on the program itself, how it's run, how it's delivered, what are the different components of it, um, and um, all the other details which could be relevant to you. So let's just start, and as I mentioned, you can, you're can you more than welcome to put your questions down and we'll cover them at the end of the seminar. So let's just start with um, a bit of a background to SOAS. You probably, most of you already are familiar with the school. Uh, it's the School of Oriental and African Studies, which focuses on the study of humanities and social sciences um, and languages, mainly relating to Asia, Africa, um, and the Near and Middle East. Um, not only through um, a generic sort of global approach to it, but also through provision of regionally specific uh, uh, knowledge and expertise. It has a central London location where, um, if you look at us on the map, um, we're right in the uh, middle of uh, London, close to not only the key sort of perhaps tourist sites that you'd be interested in, but also more importantly, we are very closely uh, located um, uh, with uh, universities such as LSE, King's College London, and uh, UCL, Birkbeck, which is great because that means that you not only are part of the source community, but you also are part of these universities in London, uh, which are very closely knit and you can um, attend seminars and events in those other places and create collaborations with them. Um, the other thing which is quite unique to SOAS is that it's a pretty small campus uh, of 6,300 students. And what that means is that on the one hand, there is this very strong community field, which is what I always hear from our students uh, at, uh, at SOAS. Uh, but it also means that it's quite easy to maneuver your way around uh, the school and also to get to know other departments and other students who are studying a very wide range of degrees and in some cases you know develop interests or have a chance to essentially um, explore other fields on individual field of study. Uh, more than half of our university uh, of our students are from outside of the UK so they are from Europe but also from Asia Africa Middle East and North Africa and uh, the Americas so Latin America or North America um, which is great diversity at SOAS and um, and despite this kind of diverse uh, range of students that we have there is always a number of things which binds them together um and those um kind of common idea include the, um, a sense of curiosity for things which is just beyond europe beyond your place of birth necessarily or uh, beyond the boundaries of the country that you come from and this desire to get to uh, know other cultures other languages and there is that sense of kind of wanting to explore what is just beyond your immediate interests and comfort zones and um, look at the rest of the world um, and um, uh, not ha having things such as a sort of a Eurocentric, perhaps being a London perspective on various topics. Um, and also kind of reading widely the literature which comes from other regions of the world. Um, so these are some elements to do with SOAS. One, one last point is that SOAS offers this fantastic uh, range of events which all the students are able to attend uh, on a daily basis, multiple events, whether it's from departments such as music department in terms of concerts and talks, 
to uh, panel discussions organized by the um, economics department, uh, politics, um, school of finance and management, as I'll mention later on. And, and this is um, a very important element of sort of a student experience here, whereby um, many students are able to actually explore well beyond um, to just the sort of immediate course of the study. Um, I have put a link here uh, that you can click just to see the range of kind of events that we have at SOAS um, on a daily basis. Um, now let's move to talk a little bit about the School of Finance and Management, um, where, as I mentioned, this MSc program is hosted. Um, the department um, is a leading center globally um, in Europe and, and at the world level for research in the areas of finance and management in particular. And its aim, as many other departments at SOAS, is to um, provide a theoretically and empirically rich understanding of finance and management at the global level. But then what really takes the department uh, beyond other similar departments in Europe or in the US is that it offers this regional speciality um, on these topics relating to finance and management. Uh, through its emphasis on Asia, uh, uh, Africa, Middle East, and North Africa. And that's really sort of where the department's um, strength come in, that it not only covers all the basic kind of information and uh, discussions at a theoretical level relating to the topics that you'll be covering, such as international management, but it extends it beyond that to specific regional specialities. Um, I'll go into the, a bit more detail on that when we talk about um, the program itself. Um, we have a number of research centers um, at the School of Finance and Management, including the Center for Global Finance, Center for Trust Research, and um, an important project on inclusive finance. Um, I will, um, so I'm going to talk about this Center for Global Finance in a second. Um, but these research uh, centers essentially focus mainly on um, providing very specialized uh, research. I will also talk to you a little bit about finance and management seminar series and also a business network seminar series, which we hold at the department on a weekly basis. And again, it's open to all the students to participate in. Um, now, Let's uh, move to one of these centers, which is our latest research center that we have set up. And it's one of the most active ones in the department. Um, and it's called the Center for Global Finance. It's been set up at the back of a um, rich um, level of funding from the Economic and Social Research Council. And basically what this center does as an example of a research center, it focuses on research in mega trends in the global finance and their impact on development in the international financial system and the world economy as a whole. So um, they try to kind of create um, these understandings of um, these interlinkages between finance, stability, and growth. Um, the center is headed by Professor Victor Morinta, and they offer every year a number of MPhil and PhD students to come and join them. As I mentioned, they have this uh, really interesting seminar series on a weekly basis where they invite external speakers in the field, um, in relevant areas, to um, give us a talk. Um, and it's one of those seminars which are quite popular by a lot of our students. Now let's uh, move on to the program that you are more specifically interested in, and that's the MSc International Management in the Middle East and North Africa. So I'll tell you a little bit about um, the program itself. So it's convened uh, by two people, uh, myself, Saharad, and uh, Professor Bassan Fatou. Um, so we are essentially responsible for those students who are uh, undertaking this program. Um, I myself am an economist um, with experience outside of academia as an economist working for the UN for a number of years before coming back to academia. And Professor Fatou, he's, um, uh, apart from being, of course, um, a professor at our department, he's also the head of the Oxford University's Energy Institute. Um, now, the focus of the program is to try and emphasis management and environmental characteristics in the context of the MENA region. 
So within this, we try to analyze key aspects of MENA business environment and management practice. So in a sense, if you like, we try to position MENA within the global management perspective, but also have specific uh, um, analysis conducted on understanding the, the dynamics of management practices and notions and approaches within the region itself. Um, so throughout your, the course of your studies, and I will take you through them, that you will be conducting a number of core modules that you have to take, as well as elective uh, modules, optional modules. Um, now, the purpose of the core ones, which are essentially your compulsory modules, are to give you the principles and applications of international management and to, to, to get an understanding of this interplay, interaction between the global and local factors influencing, for example, management in the MENA region. Um, when it comes to your optional modules, which are the modules that you can choose, uh, you can either choose modules which give you some management skills that you can apply in the future to various scenarios and various workplaces, or you can choose um, modules which, have, which give you specialized um, knowledge uh, in terms of understanding regional business environments around the world. Um, I'll come back to this in a second. Uh, let's go back to sort of the overall aim of the program. So on the one hand, um, the program will give you this body of knowledge in the content areas, such as you know, international management, broadly speaking. Uh, so two of your core modules will be kind of quite concentrated on understanding your conceptual frameworks, the macro pictures when it comes to international management, and so on. At the same time, we want to develop a skills that differentiate the influence of local and global actors in different regional settings. So in this case, you, know, you, you have a body of knowledge which would be very specific to the MENA region. Um, at the same time, as we saw us, we would like to encourage you to develop critical thinking about some existing assumptions in international management when it comes to certain regions of the world, such as the Middle East and North Africa. So we try to kind of understand how those topics are being looked at at the international level, but then try and sort of criticize them and evaluate them. We also try to equip students where we can with, um, uh, to research their own organizations or be able to um, have the skills to work as researchers and consultants in other organizations later on once they graduate. And, and, and here is some of those practical kind of skills which come in handy, such as, for instance, through writing assignments and giving presentations to develop effective communication skills. Um, to have um, a good research skill uh, set that you hopefully arrive at by the end of your degree, the ability to be able to present your ideas well, to be able to listen, articulate ideas and argue, um, uh, and, and be able to have that critical thinking. Now, um, overall, what you need uh, is 180 credits. Um, you need to complete 180 credits during your um, MSc program. Now, that is divided into um, four core modules. So you have to um, undertake four compulsory modules. Each of them have 15 credits, adding up to 60. And then four optional modules, which again, each of them add up to 15%, uh, adding up to an overall 60 units. Um, and then you have a dissertation which you're submitting at the end of your degree and that on its own as one piece of work has uh, um, 60 credits uh, attached to it. Now what are these core modules and optional modules? Let's look at them in a bit more detail. So to begin with on the top you have the um, um, dissertation which as I mentioned has about 60% in terms of credit. Uh, I will talk you through a little bit more detail about what a dissertation is. It's an important piece of work. It's a standalone um, uh, item. And as you see, it's going to has a high amount of credit associated with it. Then you have four core modules. So these are compulsory modules if you take this program. Two of them, research methods in management and international management, they are broader. They uh, focus beyond the MENA region. They give you the 
um, basic framework and the important frameworks that you need to have in mind if you want to study international management. And then you have two regional modules, management perspectives and sectoral issues in MENA and economic business and institutional environment of the MENA, which are very much specific, of course, to the MENA region. And those two are delivered by myself and um, uh, Basel. Now, so you, this page, everything on it, you have to undertake. And then from the next page, these are your optional modules that you have to choose a number of. Uh, so you have to choose four modules from this list. The list sometimes varies slightly from year to year. And that is mainly due to the fact that sometimes um, the colleagues who are teaching a particular course and might be on research leave or we might have new courses which are being added, etc. But more or less, this is the kind of uh, the types of uh, modules which are available for you to choose from. Of course, sometimes you might want to say, well, I want to do something more to do with um, MENA. So you go and choose one of your as one of your optional modules, Islamic Banking and Finance. Sometimes we've had MENA students who want to go into businesses which deal between MENA and China. So then they go on and study a module like topics in the Chinese economy. Whereas if you want to kind of study more broader topics such as corporate governance, corporate um, finance, cross-cultural management, then you can choose other ones. And of course, you can see that some of them are offered in term one and term two. So the idea is that in term one, you do two compulsory modules, two optional modules, and similarly, in term two, you select two sel um, uh, optional modules and two uh, compulsory ones. Now, uh, I thought maybe let me talk to you about some of the topics that we cover in our core modules, which are focused on MENA, just to give you a flavor of you know what are the types of discussions we are having. having. Um, so, for instance, in the two MENA modules that we have in term one and term two, we cover um, issues such as state business relations. Middle East and North Africa, as you probably already know, is one of those regions of the world where you have a heavy state involvement in every sphere of the economy. So, from the central bank to the state owning all the, some of the largest businesses and some of the largest companies, uh, etc. So it's very important to understand the type of state business relations which exist in the region. And of course, what we do is that we want to say that there is no one type of state business relations um, across the region. So if you look at countries such as a country such as Saudi Arabia, the way in which the state and the business relate to one another are quite different from an economy such as Tunisia, which is much smaller, non-oil based, a lot more private sector economic activity. Um, we also cover the issue of privatization, something which has been slow and uneven in the MENA region, but changing over time. We look at um, the region's attractiveness in terms of foreign direct investment and how political risk is one of those issues which has prevented certain uh, foreign investors from coming into the region. We look at the important issues such as institutional and business environment, corporate governance, Importantly, we also focus on labor markets and human resource management uh, because, again, the MENA region is one of those regions of the world which has the highest levels of um, youth and female unemployment. And it generally has very high levels of unemployment. So it's very important to be aware of the implications of that for international management or when you are discussing things such as human resource management. Um, again, huge differentiations between countries of the region. So you have, again, a country like Kuwait, where you have most of your workers being uh, non-nationals, foreign nationals. And then you have a country like uh, Egypt or Iran, where it's mainly dealing with large populations of national workers. So again, very different implications for them. We also emphasize um, uh, issues such as entrepreneurship, uh, the rise of a small and medium-sized enterprises, corporate social responsibility, and then dedicated uh, lectures and discussions to important topics such as oil and gas markets and the business activities there, financial markets as an important part of the services sector um, for businesses, and also looking at trade agreements and trade performance across the various countries of the region. Now, what is our teaching method in the student profiles? Um, so normally we have lectures, um, so between your core modules and optional modules, you normally have a one or two hour lecture 
but it depends on the module. Some of them are shorter than others. And it's always combined with a seminar later in the week where you have a chance to discuss what has been taught in the lecture, plus discuss the uh, readings that you have done. And in most cases, um, or in a lot of the modules, uh, students are expected to also give a presentation. Um, the approach to teaching uh, across the department, as is across SOAS, is quite multidisciplinary, uh, which basically means that we look at uh, a problem or an issue or a topic from multiple disciplinary angles. So, for example, if I'm looking at the oil markets in the region, I don't only look at it through the lens of economics or finance, but I also look at the political economy of the oil sector, I look at the politics of the oil sector, etc. So it's kind of bringing that approach to, in a sense, complete the picture uh, that we're trying to understand and analyze. And of course, we try to both combine theoretical as well as empirical um, uh, depth. Uh, so each of the lectures will provide you with a theoretical basis um, and combine that with an empirical level of analysis in terms of case studies and examples from various regions of the world. Um, our class sizes are generally small uh, compared to other similar universities, which provides an excellent opportunity for us to um, provide a platform for our students to engage with us much more closely. So class discussions are often a lot more active because we have a smaller groups and everyone is passionate to get involved um, during the lecture. Also, the smaller numbers allow for students to feel more comfortable to ask questions from the lecturer as the lecture goes by. Um, and generally, there's a lot more attention which uh, we can provide to our students. Um, we also provide reading lists, so every module will have its own reading list where you have a, a suggested number of readings um, from books to articles to online sources that you need to cover as you go along in your studies. Um, now, um, the assessment methods um, are something else which is important to mention. So how do we assess students throughout the year? We normally have um, essays. Most modules have essays which you need to submit um, to, um, to the convener at the end of the course. And then we have exams which uh, will take place at the end of the year, around May or June. So we don't have any exams in the middle of the year. Um, in addition, some modules also um, have about 10% uh, of the module which come from a presentation that you make during the seminar or during tutorial. Um, so it's a combination of um, essays, um, exams, and presentations. What is our typical student profile? We, in a way, I must say, we don't have a typical student profile. We, we just have a very diverse range of students. Some have an interest to come and do a degree, which will benefit their career. And some want to carry on doing research in that field, so they're more research focused. Uh, some of our students have professional experience. Some of them come straight after university with um, little professional experience. So again, we design our courses in a way which would cater a middle point there so that we benefit everyone. Um, now, what um, um, so we, we have normally actually for the MENA region in particular, um, a, a large number of students or the kind of a relatively large number of students who come from family businesses who want to go back and use a degree to run or take up a position within their family business. Uh, some want to go on and establish their own enterprises, and some want to go on and do a PhD or another master's program in a related topic. So it's pretty diverse uh, groups that uh, we have. Um, let me tell you something about the dissertation. So the dissertation is this one-off um, module at the end of your course. Uh, uh, which essentially you don't have lectures for or anything. Um, it's a long piece of writing that you need to do. So normally essays are about 2,500 or 3,000 words. Those are the normal size of essays you do throughout the course. But for dissertation, it's 10,000 words. And uh, the dissertation is worth a third of your fi final mark. Um, 
And it's also quite important because um, uh, the mark that you get for your dissertation to some extent can have a huge influence on the class of your degree. Um, now, normally, so there, uh, you propose, uh, you discuss a potential topic with your potential supervisor. And in term two of your studies, you have to suggest and submit what your proposed topic for your dissertation is. And you also get an allocated supervisor. Um, then you can start meeting with your supervisors. Uh, you're normally required to meet with them three times. And um, uh, by, by sort of around uh, mid-June, you are supposed to have had all your meetings with your supervisor and essentially then spend summer writing your dissertation with the view to submit it in around mid-September when the deadline is. Um, now, maybe I'll finish some, uh, on some career prospects. Um, so what's the advantage of doing this in MSC International Management with the reference to media region, especially also at a place like SOAS? Um, so what this program does is that it provides you not only uh, the basic knowledge that you would have if you studied international management anywhere else, but also this regional uh, spe uh, specialization on top of it. And these days in an international competitive uh, job market, if you have something which is a bit more specialized, a bit more niche, that normally gives you an advantage uh, over others who are interested, uh, you know, other candidates who are applying for the same job. And this is one of the main um, benefits that uh, our students who go on to get jobs come back and tell us that, you know, it was that sort of regional speciality which really get, gave them that edge uh, over everyone else, kind of a more of a global outlook, if you like, rather than, for example, someone who's done international management based purely on um, kind of studies of the European economies or the um, British economy. Um, um, most students go into finance, business or management sectors, but we also have a large number of students who go and work for international companies, regional companies or organizations. So this could be within certain industries like the oil industry or um, in the textile industry uh, at management positions or um, organize, international organizations uh, such as uh, the United Nations or the World Bank. Um, and we also have a number of students who historically have gone on to set up their own enterprises in the region. So for example, last year one of our students at the moment he set up his own enterprise um, uh, in the US where he came from and to work with um, health related companies and health service providers in Iraq and Turkey. So we have a lot of students who kind of do that. They go on and set up small and medium-sized enterprises. We also have the students who go into international consultancy. So for example, um, uh, going and working for companies such as um, McKinsey International. McKinsey is in particular is quite popular um, to provide basically very High, highly skilled research uh, work for them. Uh, so then you'd be assigned to certain regions of the world, in this case, most likely the MENA region and maybe even specifically to certain countries. Um, and we have then for uh, students who go on to study further. So they pursue a PhD program within the department. So um, I think that's all I want to say at the moment. Thank you, good luck with Whatever your future choice is, hopefully it'll be so as, but whatever that choice is going to be. If you have any questions um, from us, of course, my email and Bassam's email was on one of the first slides, but on top of it, we have these are the uh, contacts uh, of the key people within our departmental office. These are not academic members of the staff, but um, uh, colleagues who can help you if you have questions about joining the department uh, or different study study routes that you want to take and so on and so forth. So I think I will finish it here and uh, please email me if you have any questions and I think we have one question in our chat box from Claudia. Nice to meet you Claudia. So I read out Claudia's question. She's asking, if I don't speak Arabic, what is the likelihood that I would be able to understand well Islamic banking and uh, find a job related to it. 
It's a very relevant question and a very important one. Um, so knowing Arabic is not a requirement for being able to complete this degree. So of course, if you do speak Arabic, it gives you an advantage because you can read some of the material that would be available also in Arabic, um, articles, etc. However, to finish our courses and complete them successfully, you don't need that because all the courses are taught in Arabic and most and all the material that we provide to you are in English. So, uh, so in that sense, uh, you don't have to worry about that. Islamic banking, the same thing. Again, um, all the concepts uh, will be explained very well to you and you don't have to uh, be worried about kind of completing it. Now, finding a job, that's a different question. It depends on whether you want that job to be in the MENA region or uh, outside of the region. Of course, English is the most important asset for you to have. Now, if you're operating in the region, a lot of the companies these days, their working language is English. Um, of course, needless to say, if you do have Arabic, it will help you gel more closely with the country that you're living in, if it happens to be in the region, um, and also for you to integrate better. Sometimes some jobs would require you specifically to have uh, Arabic as a second language, but it's not a strict requirement. So I would not say that it's, it would be an obstacle to, to, uh, to that. Um, second question we have from Simo. Nice to meet you again. Um, would this program be useful for a student with a Middle East Studies background, IR, that is interested in the intersection of social enterprise and NGO work? Also a fluent Arabic speaker. So, well, you tick a lot of boxes. I think it's um, definitely your background in Middle East Studies with, uh, and IR, international relations, would help uh, your understanding of uh, the economic aspects and business and management aspects of the region. Why, as we all know, of course, MENA is a region of the world where economics is closely associated uh, with politics. Um, unfortunately or fortunately, I don't know which one it is, but um, so if you know the totality of um, some issues with international relations which relate to the region, or if you have a studied Middle East studies, it would provide you some of that background information to then come on board and get into completely sort of uh, with, with that regional knowledge that you have to get into the, um, the economics, business and management side of um, topics that we teach. Um, and I think this issue of uh, intersection of social enterprise and NGO is quite interesting. We, we do, as I mentioned, sort of a few lectures which are dedicated to uh, entrepreneurship development uh, in the Arab world, we also, but also Turkey and Iran. Um, we also focus on the rise of social enterprises after, or enterprises in general after the Arab Spring. And um, we also focus on issues such as corporate social responsibility and so on. So in Europe specifically, we, there are issues that you know, we, we are quite linked to them, which we discuss, even though we don't have a direct uh, focus on NGOs themselves. But it's going to be look at the overall institutional and the business environment within which uh, such enterprises um, operate. Um, now, we have a question from Marta. She's asking, will SOAS provide partners we can work for? Um, are there partnerships between the university and some companies? And a second question, will all exams be at the end of term two? So second question uh, to be answered, um, yes. So all the exams, so of course you have modules which are for one term and you um, study them in term one. You submit an essay for them at the end of term one, so kind of around Christmas time. And, um, but then you will sit for the exam for that module at the end of term two. Um, it's a little bit of a challenge, but what we do normally to help with that is to um, provide in term three, we have a short term three, which is after the Easter break, we provide revision classes. And those revision classes will go over the topics that we have already taught in term one. So that's an opportunity for you to kind of refresh your mind about the stuff that you have read in term one um, before you sit for the exam. 
Uh, the question of resource provide partners we can work for is a very good question. It's something that our department is trying to expand on. So we don't have a formal partnership with other uh, with other uh, companies um, uh, that we could sort of uh, put our graduates straight away onto internships or into uh, various placements. However, each member of the staff, they have a wide network of connections within either international de development organizations, uh, the corporate sector, international banking, etc., that they are more than happy to suggest their students or make the connections for the students. And sometimes it's um, proven to be even a bit more effective than normal placement schemes because those are students who, for example, I am recommending a student of mine to a colleague of mine at the UN, it comes as a personal recommendation. So sometimes it's a lot more effective and it can result in more long-term um, involvement of that student with that particular organization. Um, of course, we have a lot of collaborations with other universities where if you want to go on to attend classes or attend seminars at or think about doing further research in terms of a PhD program or, or, a, or an MPhil program, we're more than happy to facilitate those. Um, Sima is saying that she has a last question, which is absolutely fine. Uh, you're more than welcome to ask more. Is it possible to work and complete the program part time? Is that an option? Perhaps finish the program in a year and a half if necessary. Yes. So you can complete the program on a part time basis. Uh, normally, it will then be run over two years. Um, and that means that essentially you'll be doing half of uh, the modules every year that you're expected on a full-time program to complete. Um, so in that sense, you, um, you you can most likely kind of do it over two years. It's possible to discuss the option of, for example, starting part-time and then switching to full-time or starting full-time and then switching to part-time as well. And that might allow you a midway point of you know, one and a half years. But that is something that I would encourage you to discuss with uh, the colleagues who are on the screen, their names, Richard Story or Anya uh, Kropfitch, uh, because they can then discuss with you various formats of the studies that you can take. Um, Marta has asked a follow-up question, which is that, so for every exam, we have an essay to write at the end of the module and then the oral part. So, so this is how it happens. Let's say you're doing a module on um, economics of the MENA region. So let me go back to where we had put the modules. I'm sure you can still see them on the screen. So here we are. So let's say under the core modules, you're doing management perspectives and sectoral issues in the Middle East and North Africa. Now, you have 10 lectures for this. You have um, uh, one term of the study of this. Um, throughout that uh, one term, in one of the seminars, you will be allocated to do a presentation. So you give a presentation to the class for about 20, 30 minutes. That would count as 10% of your overall mark. And then you will have um, to, at the end of the course, so come December, for example, you submit an essay. And that essay, uh, which is normally 2,500 words, we provide a number of topics. Uh, questions to you that you can uh, choose one and write an essay on and that counts for about 30 percent um, and then you have uh, a final exam which will be about 60 percent of the overall mark for that module so your total mark will is will come from a combination of what you get for your presentation what mark you get for your essay and what mark you get for the exam I hope that's clear, um, sort of how, how the whole thing is combined. Um, Claudia is asking, would there be an MRES course that could lead to PhD international management of MENA? Um, I think we do have an MRES course. Um, I am not sure the of the details of it in terms of what requirements you need to have in order to complete it, in terms of what types of modules you need to take. Uh, and how it kind of how it varies exactly from the current one, but again, I am more than happy to uh, get those information for you. Or I would suggest that you contact Richard Story, our departmental manager, to send you exactly the kind of um, degree program 
that you would be studying um, in terms of your, um, you know, wanting a research-based, essentially for those of you who don't know, MRES is a research-based uh, master's program which can lead into a PhD program. Um, so that's something that I would encourage you, Claudia, to check with our departmental manager so that you can get a whole set of the requirements and what the module is structured look like, etc. Um, uh, we have a question from Martin talking about work again. Will there be events in which we can meet some companies and eventually get in touch with them for a future job or an internship, a career day, for instance? Absolutely. So SOAS has a careers office. Um, so that, that, that's at the SOAS level, where they, um, a number of times a year, they bring companies and um, um, firms and international organizations to represent themselves so that our students can interact with them. Now, they always have a large uh, cohort of companies who come in specifically with an interest in economics, business, and management. And, um, and those are excellent opportunities, actually, for our students to meet some of these um, companies and um, potentially explore future job opportunities. But again, because our students have such a varied um, range of interest in terms of what they want to do with their degrees afterwards. Sometimes it's also um, a matter of coming and discussing your specific interests and the type of companies you want to work with with your tutors. So you will be assigned a personal tutor um, for your entire year, which will be one of the academic members of the staff. Most likely, since you'll be studying in a region, it be myself or Basel. So you can, one of the uh, functions of having a tutor is that you can go to them at a personal level and say, well, I'm interested in these areas. Um, do you know anyone or how do you think I should go about uh, approaching these organizations with a view to get employment with them in the near future? So absolutely, there is both school-wide um, activities which you can do, but also at a personal uh, level, you can get a lot of um, um, options through your tutors. Well, if there is no more questions, then I would say good luck. And um, of course, as I said, I'm always available for any further questions through email. And uh, look forward to speaking through uh, to you uh, through email later on. Um, as you make your applications. Thank you and goodbye.